And we're going to get started with New York Cannabis Licensing Boot Camp. So get ready for some obstacle courses or whatever you do in a boot camp. It's not that kind. It's a legal boot camp where lawyers talk at you for an hour. So get ready for that. Um, <laughs> I guess arm yourself with coffee. That's what I'll say. So thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Jennifer Cabrera, and I am counsel in the New York and New Jersey offices of the Sente Cedarburg. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, the Sente Cedarburg is um, a law firm that focuses exclusively on the cannabis, hemp, and psychedelics industries. That's all we do, and that's all we've been doing for um, about a dozen years now. Founded in Denver in 2010, have offices in the major adult use markets, including LA, Boston, um, of Michigan, Florida, and we launched our New York office in 2019, um, which is when I joined the firm. So um, I am joined today by my excellent colleagues, um, Michelle Bodian and Stephen Pemberton. So um, I'll turn it to you, Steve, for your, to introduce yourself quickly, then over to Michelle. Hey everyone, I'm Steve Pemberton. I've been with Vicente Cedarburg now for about a year and a half. I'm an associate in the Tri-State Practice Group. I support clients in New York, as well as New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. Um, at this point, I've helped submit dozens of applications, both at the state and local levels, mostly in New Jersey. Um, and I help clients address a variety of state and local level licensing issues. Great. Hi, everyone. Michelle Bodian here, uh, counsel as well with VS uh, out of our New York office. And I can give you a long bio, but don't want to bore you. So do all things licensing and compliance in the tri-state. So let's uh, hop on in because we have a lot to cover today. So just a brief overview of the boot camp. Uh, I also don't know what's involved with the boot camp, but I certainly don't think we'll be doing any push-ups today because I can't do any. But we'll give you a quick update on adult use implementation generally in New York, and obviously diving into um, the conditional adult use retailer dispensary application. For those not familiar with the acronym, while there's a U in it, the entire state has decided to ignore it, and we're calling it a card, uh, card application. So we'll go into when our applications do, who's eligible, where are they going to be located, any ownership and control limitations, property considerations, and then some nitty gritty of, okay, you think you qualify, you want to apply, what do you actually need to gather, how do you submit, uh, anything you can do now in this last week before the application opens up, and then looking at some scoring considerations should this end up being a hyper-competitive application, and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions and answers. And in uh, anyone at this point unfamiliar with Zoom, there is both a chat function and a Q&A function. So if you actually have some questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A function. Helps us keep track a little bit better uh, than things getting lost in the chat. And a copy of this PowerPoint will be sent out to the entire group, anyone who registered after the fact, so don't feel like you have to take notes. And I'm not controlling the PowerPoint, so I'm gonna say next slide, please. Okay, here's where we are. Here are the two licenses that have been issued to date. A card will be the third of the three, three out of three of the conditional licenses. So there is conditional adult use, uh, conditional adult use cultivator license, as well as conditional adult use processor license for the conditional cultivator. That application period has already closed. It closed on June 30th. New York State is working through approving all of these uh, licenses and applications. There's still a few more pending in the queue, but to date, 242 licenses have been granted. Plants have already gone in, gone out, they've been harvested. So cultivation is well on its way in New York State. As a reminder for these two conditional cultivator and processor, the eligibility criteria, the main one here was that you had to have been a hemp processor or a uh, cannabinoid hemp cultivator. So for both these license types, there are no regulations. Uh, there's terms and conditions and guidance documents, uh, but they uh, rushed this application to market so quickly that they didn't have time to do regulations. And then for a conditional adult use processor, the application period is open for a couple more weeks, uh, but the number of universe of who's eligible to apply is pretty limited. Uh, and then on Monday's meeting of the Cannabis Control Board, they did approve the first 15 licensed processors. And we wanted to touch on implementation one because 
you know, interesting, why not? But two, these are the two license types. These operators are going to be the supply chain that will be giving the card licensees uh, products to sell. So these are our cultivators. This is who's growing the adult use cannabis. These are gonna be our processors who are processing it into, uh, you know, edibles and other products for then the card applicants, card licensees uh, to be able to sell. Next slide. So unlike the two other conditional license type, we do have regulations um, and that matters because it's a bit more static. It's not as if an FAQ is gonna come down tomorrow and then greatly change everything. Thankfully so far, the FAQs that are coming up and down are just modifying and clarifying the regulations. So these uh, card regulations were adopted and were effective as of August 3rd when they were published in the state register. Notably, there was a draft of these. They did go out for public comment. The state did receive 650 public comments uh, in order to expedite this license type. They did not make any changes, but they did respond to all the comments, more or less, uh, and in bulk, not individually responding to 650. And they said they may make changes or some clarifications through the FAQs that are coming out. So that's the boring legal stuff, the relevant piece. We do know when the application is going live. So this was just announced. Of course, in 2022, it was announced via a tweet and then followed up by a press release, but they had to give us our two-week notice of when this was coming. We got our two weeks notice. Applications will go live on August 25th. They will stay open for more or less 30 days and it will close on September 26th. This is going to be an online application, go environment, nothing paper, all online using New York's Business Express portal. This is the license portal that they used for those conditional cultivator conditional process, as well as for all the cannabinoid hemp licenses to date, as well as, you know, the rest of New York State uses this for other purposes as well, but we only care about cannabis, so let's focus on that. Uh, so it is going to be on, uh, go live on August 25th. We don't know, is it going live at 9 a.m. or midnight, trying to figure that out, but sometime during the day, it's going to be available. We assume first thing to then start populating. But in the meantime, we do have an application mock-up that you can take a look to know what's coming as well as um, other FAQs, as I mentioned. And we do have not only the links within the slides, but at the end, we've got a resource slide so you can find all the links, because I will say their website's not the easiest to navigate. Next slide. All right, eligibility criteria. Uh, I assume somehow you think you may or may not qualify, and that's how you ended up here today. So let's just hit what it's gonna take to be involved. Essentially, to be eligible, the applications must be led by someone who's both a uh, justice-involved individual who has business experience and significant presence in New York State. So a couple different ways to get here. Um, if we can go on to the next one. There we go. <laughs> So uh, significant presence in New York State, a couple different ways to get here, uh, you know, organized or incorporated in the state of New York, the majority of the owners need to be physically present in the state, need to have a corporate office, or even opening a bank account. And important to know that this is the applicant itself that needs to have significant ties to the state. So the applicant can be uh, a new entity or it's an individual, it can be made up in a number of different ways, but making sure it's not only the just, not just the justice involved individual, but the actual applicant itself, which might be a different uh, corporate structure, can meet these requirements. Next slide. So the, as I said, applicant can be an individual or an entity where at least one individual is justice involved. And that uh, means someone whose life was impacted by a conviction for a marijuana related offense. Um, this doesn't just mean an individual who was uh, convicted. It also includes family members of people who were convicted of a marijuana related offense. Um, you also need to provide evidence of the residency of that justice involved individual at the time of the arrest or conviction. And we'll get into that, how this, uh, the primary address may actually impact your scoring. And as well, uh, you know, which this I say of all the criteria seems to be giving a lot of individuals pause of the ability to meet it, but the justice involved individual needs to presently hold the time of application or previously holds could have been a decade ago, 
um, held an ownership interest of at least 10% for two years and control of a business that had net profits for at least two years. So needed to be at least 10% owner of a business, had to have been that owner for at least two years and had to have had net profits for at least two years. Again, this could be a present business looking back the past two years, but this could be 20 years ago ran, running a successful business, you own 10% and was profitable for two years, but you sold that business. As long as you got the paperwork to prove that all, you would still be eligible. Next slide. And then you can also qualify not only as an individual, but as a nonprofit. Uh, I, I'm not gonna get very detailed on this, but just know that you could still qualify even if you don't, uh, if you're not an individual, but you're a nonprofit that does service justice involved individuals. Um, and just if we can go back one more slide. Uh, I just wanna touch on for the, justice involved individuals needing to make sure that the conviction, qualifying conviction related to marijuana, you know, it's one of three potential offenses and it needs to be listed. The charges for the cannabis and marijuana must be listed somewhere in the conviction paperwork. So if it got pled down or if you ultimately were convicted of a different charge, but you were arrested on the marijuana charge, all of that may qualify, most likely does. You just need to make sure it's all documented in the paperwork. Um, to prove that. And then in order to be justice involved, it isn't just the person who is arrested or convicted. It could be you know, yourself if you were arrested or convicted, or it can be a parent or guardian, a spouse or child or a dependent. And the state has released, which we'll talk on available resources, and a very helpful PowerPoint that runs through a few different scenarios to describe you know, yourself of how you might qualify, as well as you know, children. and. New York State's using adult children, so it doesn't just have to be a child of yours who was arrested at age 14. They could be arrested and convicted at age 25. So there's a number of different scenarios, uh, different permutations that would have you be able to qualify as justice involved, even if you yourself was not uh, convicted of the marijuana-related offense. All right, I think I'm I breezed through all of that, a lot of detail there, but I'm gonna hand it over to Jen to get into uh, some more information. Thank you, Michelle. Um, all right. So for those of you who have been pulling your information together for the card license over the past few weeks, I'm sure you've run into a lot of the issues that Michelle's been describing, which is that while you may actually qualify by having this past conviction or the uh, the qualifying conviction, I'm sorry, the qualifying business, it's often hard to find um, uh, records from years ago. And so that is certainly something that's that's been a challenge for, for many folks, but really the more records you can find, the better. I, but moving on, um, so unusual license type and well, not completely unusual, but it's, it is unique in that um, New York is only going to be giving out supposedly 150 of these dispensary licenses to card applicants. And are they a portion The state? Well, they've broken up the state into regions, 14 regions that they've shown on this map. Um, each of those, you basically select which region you'd like to be in, and um, you rank your top five and figure out where you're going to be. And the state determines where you're going to be from there. So um, of the 14 regions, six of those are downstate are New York City and Long Island because each of the boroughs is its own region. So if you could rank just the five boroughs as your top five choices. Long Island, of course, is one region. Then you've got, mid well, you can see the map. Um, the I, What we've heard from the state so far is that they're then going to apportion a certain number of the, these licenses across the state with 85 of them supposedly being in the New York City metro area, including Long Island and Westchester County. Westchester, of course, is considered part of the Mid-Hudson region. So Westchester, Rockland counties, um, I would usually think of those as part of more of the New York City metro area, but that is Mid-Hudson if that's where you'd like to be. Um, then there's going to be an additional, this is a bit funny to me, 
15 to 20 in the Hudson Valley and Capital Region. So I assume that doesn't include all of the Mid-Hudson Region. Then there's going to be another 5 to 10 in the North Country, which is a very huge area um, bordering Canada and Massachusetts, Vermont. Um, then we've got 5 to 10 in the Southern Tier bordering Pennsylvania. Um, then supposedly then you're just going to have the rest. I don't know how they're going to apportion them between Mohawk Valley, Central New York, Finger Lakes, Western New York, but well, Western New York is 20 to 25. So either way, there's a certain amount of gaming the system when you're selecting these, your preferences. So you select preference one, and that's what you're considered for first, naturally. But if you put in preference two, for each region, the state is first going to consider people who chose it as preference number one. So if you have chosen, for instance, Manhattan as preference one, you will be competing against all the other people who chose Manhattan as their preference. If your preference number two is Brooklyn, they're first going to look in Brooklyn at everyone who chose it as their first choice. They're not going to get down to people who put it in as their second or third choice unless they don't have enough first choice card successful card applicants to fill it up. So there's an element of, I think, strategy in figuring out how you rank these and where you honestly do want to be. So moving on, this is a unique license type in that you have, um, sorry, you have <laughs> the state is talking about supplying the property. You can't use your own property, though that has changed a little bit when the state's guidance up till now. Um, they have the state has contracted with a real estate agent to identify 150 properties across the state that will be zoned properly. Um, I think the idea is that the state is going to handle all of the local land use and zoning issues or will somehow find a way to, to, to get through that without going in front of planning boards at 150 different locations. Um, that's not clear that'll work, but that is the idea right now. And then that also the state is going to turn over a turnkey property that you can consult on what you would like the property to look like in terms of color scheme or design choice. Like, do you wanna go with rustic farmhouse look or do you wanna go with sort of urban industrial? I, I think the idea that is that the state is going to, the OCM is going to work with their chosen contractor there to fit it out. That is obviously extremely unusual in the cannabis industry, and no other state has the regulatory agency identified the properties, acquired them, handled the fit out, and then turned over final, finished ready properties, turnkey properties to the dispensary license holders. But that is the idea. So if the state follows through with this program, no, you can't use your own property. You can't choose the street address. You put in your choice of where you would like your dispensary to be, but whether or not you're put there is really up in the air. But then also beyond that, whether or not you, like what street you're on, what neighborhood you're in, that's really a bit beyond your control. You can choose and you can put in your preference, but you may not get it. So this is a very kind of unique feature of this. Then once you have this property, you are there for the four-year term of the conditional license. If you'd like to move or switch over to a regular adult use license, meaning not pursuant to this card program, you have to close up your shop, end your business, um, <laughs> do a full accounting, get rid of your inventory and close the business and apply for a new license. So it is not easy to transition out of it. In fact, it's impossible to transition out of it before the four-year period ends. Next, um, the question that is often asked is, will there be a, um, a, what kind of rent are you paying? The state has indicated that it's going to be market rent um, and that obviously market rent will be higher if you're in Brooklyn than if you're in Staten Island or if you're somewhere in the Finger Lakes. We don't know what those will be. Um, so the state has created um, 
another kind of unique thing about this fe feature of this is that we the state has created the social equity canada is tasked with raising 200 million dollars to help fund this entire process. These, this money will be used for acquiring the properties for all of the fit outs and then for loans to the card licensees. One thing that the state has stated very clearly is that these loans will not be repayable in the event of a default. So if your business does not work out and you have to close up shop, they're not going to pursue you in bankruptcy court. Presumably, that that's the legal meaning of they, you're not going to be liable for it. I don't know if that's how it'll end up being, but that is that is what they're saying now. That is also gives you an insight into why the state is being so picky in terms of finding applicants who have a record of successfully running their own business, because they want people who are not going to default, who are going to be able to successfully run this. Um, the card licensee is going to pay a program fee to the fund that is going to include rent and presumably repayment of some of these loans. And that is going to be the administrator that the card licensee interfaces with, social equity impact ventures, or rather that's the, that's the limited partner of the state, but rather it's going to be a joint venture between them. Whatever partnership is created, that come that entity is going to be the one that the licensee deals with so it's a bit complex and the truth is we just don't know how it's going to work in pra in practice now moving into even drier legal material but for all the lawyers on the call i think this stuff is fascinating and i sort of it's been interesting to me digging through the various not only regulations but all the guidances that the state has issued up till now so there is this concept of a true party of interest um, that is defined in the card regulations that is basically, it includes an owner, principal, officer, anyone who has a future right of interest. So if you have a convertible note or an option agreement, you're considered a true party of interest for that licensee. Um, if someone guarantees the debts of the license and that is included, also, they're going to go back to the natural person. So if you have a card license applicant that is owned by an LLC, which is owned by an LLC, which is owned by a corporation, the state is going to want to see the human beings that own that corporation. They want to know the human beings at the top of the management chain that actually own this. So it's not enough to put legal entities in the way and to avoid disclosure, no you're going to have to actually go through the disclosure requirements for the actual people that own these entities. Um, another interesting feature is that a TPI or true party of interest includes all the folks that I've described up to now, owners, officers, and so forth, also their spouses. So if I get on one of these licenses, which I'm not, but if I have an ownership interest or I'm chief legal officer, that means my husband also is considered a true party of interest. So any ownership restrictions that apply to me would also apply to him. So it's something to think about if you have your cannabis power couple looking to get on your own licenses, not gonna work in New York. Another very interesting thing that came out, and by the way, um, we have at the end of this power a list of resources that we're citing here um, because some of this information comes from the card regs, but a lot of it also comes from guidance, the, the card FAQ that came out, as well as an FAQ relating to true parties of interest that's aimed at the adult use cultivators and processors, as you'll see at the bottom of the screen. That FAQ has some of the most interesting information, I think, for lawyers looking at this and figure, and also just for folks who are figuring out who do I need to disclose on this application. It also contained this fascinating information, fascinating in quotes, um, about what, um, uh, how could I say it, like a management company or you have an IP license agreement or any vendor that is entitled to payments from the company, which of them are true parties of interest? That's often one of like the hot button issues in a given state's regulatory system. Here, New York is saying if you are entitled to 10% or more of gross revenue, 
or 50% or more of the net profits of a licensee, you're considered a true party of interest. Same thing if you're entitled to more than $100,000 as a flat fee during the course of a calendar year. So this is very interesting because let's say you're not a manager, you're not on the cap table, you don't have any officer position, but you are providing some sort of services in exchange for 15% of gross revenue, you're a TPI. So these numbers, I, I was very happy to see that the state had provided them. It just gives you guardrails for how, how to proceed. All right, so there's TPIs, and then there's also something called financiers. A uh, financier is anyone other than a financial institution, bank, or also other than the, um, the fund that provides capital, whether as a gift or as a loan to the license holder. A financier cannot have an ownership interest in any license holder. They can't have any control or share of revenue other than what was listed before on that slide that I was just describing. So financiers, and we'll talk about this a little in the next slide, is a different type of um, <laughs> person that is affiliated with a license. It's a step down from a TPI, okay? Now, basically right now, just bear with me, I'm going through definitions. The next factor to consider is that New York has come up with a tiered system, similar to what they've done for um, alcohol. So there's the supply tier, which is cultivation, processing, and distribution. So people that are, all the, the licenses that are plant touching, but don't touch consumers, then the retail tier. So dispensing, the consumption lounges, which we still have rules about, and delivery. They all interface with, with the customer in the end. No one can have an, a direct or indirect interest in both tiers. That is in the, it's effectively in the law and in the regs. Now, here are the limitations that I think we really want to focus on. So um, an individual cannot be a true party of interest, number one, in more than three dispensary licenses. That was in the law. That's not surprising. Each dispensary license gets you one location. And so if you want three locations, you need to apply for three licenses. That can be one card license, and then you can apply for two normal retail licenses some point down the road. Next, um, someone who is a true party of interest in a retailer can't also be a TPI in the supply tier, all right? So they can't be in cultivation, processing, or distribution because two tiers and never the two shall meet. Um, also, a TPI in a retailer cannot be a TPI in a registered organization. Those are the medical operators, a micro business, um, or a consumption lounge, or a laboratory. So if you're in retail, that is your lane stick in it. Also, a card licensee or its TPIs can't be a financier to a business in another tier. So if um, I am on the license and I'm an officer of a card dispensary and I want to make a loan to my friend who has a cultivation, nope, not cool can't be a financier to cultivation. I have to stay in the, the card lane. However, financiers have a certain amount of exemption from these rules. They can make loans or gifts or grants across tiers. As long as you're just a financier, no control, no ownership, you may make loans to multiple tiers. Also, a financier becomes a TPI and they'll become subject to those restrictions if they get an ownership interest, control the business, or a share of revenue or profits or fees in excess of those numbers that I've listed before. So if you want to stay a financier, make sure you're not receiving more than 10% of gross revenue, 50% of net profits, or $100,000 in a calendar year. So here are the guardrails. All right. And that is it. I sort of sped through that and I will turn it over to you, Steve. All righty. Um, with all of that said, there's a lot of information you'll need to submit for this application. And we've tried to highlight some of the bigger ticket items here, but um, we really suggest that you look at the mock application to see what sort of information specifically is required, what sort of documents you can use to substantiate, you know, your eligibility. Um, and 
with respect to the mock application, keep an eye out for the real application, although by that point you'll want to be submitting. Um, we noticed that the OCM is constantly updating their FAQs, uh, so things could change, but this is a good start here. Um, some of these items, for example, proof relating to the qualifying business, this can be difficult to obtain depending on how old the business is. Say it's 20 years old, the IRS does not keep tax records forever, and you'll need to prove that the business made a profit for at least two years. So something to think about if you don't have some of these records in your personal possession. Uh, same thing with record of the qualifying conviction. You may need to go in person to obtain a certificate of disposition. So just keep some of these things in mind as we're getting closer to the start of the application period. One more thing I'll say about some of the information you'll need to submit with the application is that the OCM, at least based on the mock application, has demonstrated some flexibility when it comes to what sort of proof they will accept. Um, sometimes for some of the items, there's a little catch-all at the bottom of the mock application, for example, that says other proof that the OCM finds suitable or something along those lines. So again, um, some the list of items that you can submit for some of the criteria is a little bit open-ended, but you'll want to try to adhere to the specific items they ask for and also perhaps try to get more than is necessary if possible. For example, um, with respect to convictions, getting all of the arrest records, the certificate of disposition, all of the proof that you can, because we think in this situation, more is better than not having enough. If the OCM asks you to supply more information after you've submitted your application, you'll have a limited amount of time to do so. And some of these documents are just not that easy to get a hold of. So it's better to get all of it up front. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the OCM has released some guidance with respect to how these card applications will be scored. We don't want you to get too hung up on the scoring criteria because we're unsure at this point how much they'll actually come into play. And what I mean by that is, for example, say the OCM receives less applications than licenses that are available, how much will the applications really be scored according to some of these factors we've highlighted here? In addition, the scoring criteria are factual in nature. There's nothing you can do to change where the relevant arrest occurred or the nature of your qualifying business. Um, this is not an application where you're submitting a dozen narratives and your application is being ranked based on how strong the narratives are. The criteria here are very factual and it's not really possible to change them. Um, however, the value of the scoring criteria is this. If you're potentially looking to partner with someone or multiple individuals who qualify as justice involved, keep these scoring criteria in mind because, for example, if you're trying to determine which justice involved individual would be a better partner, you might consider where the individual was arrested because the conviction of an individual who was arrested in an area with historically low median household incomes will be weighted higher than an individual who was arrested in say like a more affluent area of New York State. And at the end of the day, you wanna remember, this is a retail license. And so the justice involved individuals retail experience is really what's valued here. Um, for example, a qualifying business that's similar to a cannabis dispensary, such as a brick and mortar retail store will be given greater weight by the OCM than someone say, with a landscaping or pool cleaning business because there is no limitation on what sort of business can be qualifying, but we think that you'd wanna look for someone if you're trying to find a justice involved individual to partner with who has retail experience and preferably in person, a real brick and mortar store. Next slide, please. So with the application period, Coming up fast, what are some of the things you can do now to prepare? 
Well, the first thing we suggest, if you haven't done so already, is to familiarize yourself with materials that OCM has released to date, including the Get Ready, Get Set workshops, the frequently asked questions on the OCM's website, and the mock application that the OCM has released. These materials, especially the FAQs, have been updated multiple times by the OCM. So do make sure to keep tabs on the OCM's website to ensure you have the most up-to-date information. They don't have any press releases or any sort of formal notification when the FAQs are updated, as far as we know. So do be sure to check and perhaps compare um, if you really want to stay on top of the OCM's most up-to-date information about this application. In terms of things you can do outside of just familiarizing yourself, um, Number one would be just to figure out whether you actually want to apply and whether you qualify. If you have not made the decision yet as to whether you want to apply, I hate to say it, but time is up and you need to decide as soon as possible and start getting the pieces together for your application. Um, number two would be that the card application will use New York's Business Express application portal and that's accessible right now. So if you're sure that you want to apply and that you qualify and you know which entity you'll be applying with, i.e. that you don't have to form a new entity, you should register on the portal as soon as possible. And if you haven't formed your entity yet, you should do so as soon as possible. Number three would be to start compiling the documents that you'll need for the application and make sure that when you scan them, they're legible, they're complete, don't cut anything off or leave out any pages of the documents. The OCM is gonna be interested to see complete documents and documents that truly prove what you're saying they do, especially when it comes to convictions and residency. Make sure your name or the justice involved individual's name is on all the documents where necessary. Um, it always takes more time than anticipated to gather these documents, especially when we could be talking about a qualifying business that operated 20 years ago, 10 years ago. It's not always easy to get the documents that you'll need, especially when you have to show multiple years worth of profitability. And you only have until September 26th to submit everything. So we're talking about a limited amount of time here to get this information together. We suggest you use this PowerPoint as sort of a roadmap to kind of gather some of the information you need along with looking at the mock application where items are very specifically listed out in terms of what they'll accept or if there's an open-ended part you can see at least that other evidence might be accepted for that item finally if you think you'll need consultants attorneys or other professionals to assist you with this application you should take steps to retain them as soon as possible don't wait um, even if you're trying to figure out whether you qualify or are eligible it might be a good idea to consult with an attorney and you know in terms of taxes all the documents you'll need if you need to get in touch with your accountant you should do so today you should get the ball rolling on that stuff immediately and with that i will pass it back to my colleagues thank you steven <clears throat> so we have a few questions in the chat and if you do have any questions you want to have answered please type them in now because we do have a little time to to address them um so the first one asks about real estate requirements um a commenter asked about the apc which are the responses to public comment where um initially the ocm said that the proposed regulations do not insist upon applicants using the New York Social Equity Cannabis Investment Fund locations and provide for the allowance of an applicant to provide their own location that complies with the proposed regulations. Well, that was up for what, Michelle, like a week, maybe less than that before a revised APC was. Yeah. It was up long enough for everyone to notice it, read it, wonder what that meant, and then they took it down. Yeah, that sentence that I just read is no longer in <laughs> that answer in the APC, and they no longer talk about being able to um, use your own location. So how to do it? The answer is there is no roadmap whatsoever for using your own location. Unless the rules for, change, you can't do it. 
for the card applications. Um, and I think we just got another question in about when other applications might open. So for this initial card round that looks like we're, we're stuck with the properties that New York State is finding and you'll be ranking your preferences and given a turnkey location, other license types will not be similarly locked in. So if you already have a property or are passionate about a particular property and they say in their FAQs, maybe this is not the program for you. Uh, so we can repeat their party line here, uh, but as of everything they're turning out, uh, when we point out inconsistencies, they're taking down any language that says you may choose your own property for this license type. There's another question about when the um, card, I assume card properties will be available for move-in. That is a very big question mark. Um, there's been talk that the OCM and DASNY have had a hard time finding um, suitable properties because it is hard to find towns that have opted in. And honestly, that's not the problem in New York right now. It's finding landlords that are willing to rent to cannabis and aren't jacking up the prices. So more recently, we've heard that more properties, bless you, Michelle, more properties have been identified and found, but I don't know. What I can tell you is that the OCM has been saying that they're going to have some um, operators in their location and supposedly operating by November 10th. That no longer seems realistic, especially considering this application is going to run through the end of September. So I would think um, there will be at least some card licensees in their locations ready to open by year's end. Does that, what do you guys think? I mean, I, you're usually more optimistic than me uh, in life. So I'd say probably if maybe early, early 2023, but um, I I'd say we were on a timeline and then COVID tends to move things a little bit around, but the state is extremely bullish on getting this all accomplished very quickly. So that is one advantage um, that we don't typically have with the states not usually pushing this forward as quickly as it is. That they'll have at least a few in their locations so they can say, look, success, we've got five open and then the rest take a while. Yep. Um, and I see one in the chat, when will applications be available for non-justice involved applicants? Uh, the same response to public comment document did say for the other priority classes of individuals, uh, service disabled veteran, distressed farmer, women minority, that those regulations we would see by the end of the calendar year, uh, usually at regulations preceding the application window. So if we see those regulations available uh, for these other priority interest groups by the end of the year that we do anticipate those retail applications would open up January, February of next year. As for distances between retail locations in the Q&A, there are none in the law or in the regulations. There are minimum distances from, um, from churches and schools and places of worship, but not from, not between each other. Though that could come in each individual town zoning for retail. So Manhattan and New York City in general is working on their own zoning. It hasn't been released yet. They could have a minimum distance there. Great, I see a question. Is there any benefit to applying earlier than September 26th or are they doing scoring only once the application window closes? Uh, love to hear Jen and Steve's thought, my two cents, if you're, if you're organized enough to apply, the sooner you're able to just apply, I mean, portal issues, off chance, they do do it on a rolling basis, certainly no reason to wait, but given that that's opening up very quickly, you know, it's a week from today, if you're able to apply, go for it, um, but, you know, that's the last possible date of September 26. I would agree with that. I just find it hard to believe that they are going to grade it on a first come first serve basis, but there's always the risk of it. So if you want to play it safe, you can apply first day. I agree. The more time you give yourself, um, the earlier you get in, the more time you'll have to add anything else that they want to. Um, as for medical cannabis application process, there has been talk for a while about um, a new RO, registered organization application opening up. Um, there, it seems like that might open later this year. So we just need to stay, stay tuned and see what happens. Next, what does APC stand for? I do not recall. I know it's the document responding to public comments, Michelle. Do you know? uh, 
Agreed. Uh... <laughs> I think it's worth a Google. <laughs> um, we can move on. When will the gray market dispensaries be cracked down <laughs> in New York City and anywhere? <laughs> Um, they'll be there was a recent it. crackdown. I mean, not just for parking fines, but did come out in New York City this week. Um, you know, at least another attempt by the city of New York, not Office of Cannabis Management, trying to crack down. Um, but again, city city of New York cracking down, not necessarily Office of Cannabis Management. I I'm optimistic, or you know, I fortune tell that now that there is an opportunity to apply and receive adult use licenses that that might spur some enforcement actions. Uh, you know, it is hard to crack down when there isn't an, another available pathway to legitimacy. But now that there is applications open for retail, maybe the state will move forward. I think that's right. I think they'll start cracking down once there are actual regulated businesses up and running or about to be up and running. And uh, five stars to Craig for uh, answers to public comments, for knowing the answer to that. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Mitchell has a question, which is more of a comment, um, that the CCB and OCM have uniquely decided to release regulations one section at a time rather than all at once. Yes, they have which is confusing. Also, they haven't received least regulations for all of these subjects. Like for instance, for the cultivators and processors, they're operating without regulations. They're operating under guidance and FAQs, which is strange to say the least. Um, so what's your advice to applicants trying to submit applications without all the information they need? Think, follow the rules such as they exist at the time. You have to read about a dozen documents or more to know what those rules are, but try to keep up and talk to a lawyer who knows what they're doing, what they're talking about and knows the industry well. That's my advice. Yeah, and I think while the public public comment process is a valuable tool and regulators often do listen and make changes based upon public comment, I'd say 80% of what the regulators want and how they're interpreting statute is the life we're living under. Whether you know that life today or going to find it out in six, uh, 60 days, six months, whenever it is. So there's only so much discretion and public input that is available through this regulatory process. I mean, it, it is the government after all. So whether you know what the environmental uh, sustainability plan is today, or you find it out in six months, you know, at the end of the day, you're still complying with it, whatever it is. Uh, so you just have to make that judgment call. In regards to the um, way you check, uh, picks locations, I'm just gonna go back to that slide. Um, Give me a minute, it's a wonky system. The state has, um, I went too far. The state has um, identified 14 geographic regions. Um, here it is, you can find this on their website. Here are the regions. Um, and what you do is select your top five choices for which region you'd like to be in. The city of New York is divided into five separate regions, so each borough region, Long Island's its own region. Westchester and Rockland counties are part of the um, Hudson Valley region. So there is, um, that's how you do it. You, you select, and if you're chosen by the state as a card licensee, they will then tell you after uh, vetting you that you have been selected, and then they'll let you know, okay, which region, and then even with region, they'll let you know what, what town, what location. So you don't have access to any of that information prior to application. So if you think you want to be in Brooklyn, but you're really passionate about a particular area, you're not going to know if the state has locked in property within that area. So it's a bit of um, blind faith that you'll get somewhere that you're interested in that uh, works for you and your business. But I mean, even though there you give up, you cede so much control with this license that you would normally have, then the on the flip side, you get a location provided to you, you get first crack at the market, and you get a loan at presumably lower than market interest. So there's some real benefits to it if you do qualify and you're kind of willing to ride this train with the OCM. Um, what a gun roller coaster. Yeah. It's going to be a wild ride. Buckle up. Yeah. <laughs> 
so, to cut off um, our joke making, does anybody have any additional questions? And I we should mention this is a two part boot camp. Uh, you should have received in the email blast or the registration. We're doing this again. Uh, not us. You don't have to listen to us again, but our compliance and licensing staff are going to drill down even deeper. It's next Thursday, so it's going to be extremely timely since the portal opens. So we can tell you everything that has changed from the mock application to the real application. But just to want to make a plug for that same time, same place, uh, just with new faces next week, next Thursday. Right. And at the end of the um, PowerPoint, which will be distributed to all um, attendees, we have some resources It's obviously limited, but some of the resources that we cited during this program, which might be helpful. Uh, one more comment. Do we have comments on software POS requirements? So the state of New York has an RFP out right now for POS systems. Uh, so that is not something that you would need to trouble yourself with at this time. It is part of the build out. Right, 150 licenses that you discussed early in the presentation with the breakdown by region. These are assumed numbers, right? Uh, this is based on st statements by the OCM. Here, I'll go back to that slide, Michelle. Yep. So I, we just mentioned that there's a, a RFP out by DASNY, so the Dormitory Authority of New York, who are building these dispensaries. So they also issued an RFP, so uh, response for public um, response for proposals from interested vendors and contractors to physically build the dispensaries. And these stats here on this slide. The regional breakdown actually comes from the state of New York's, uh, you know, request for proposals to do the build out. So this is the state of New York telling any hopeful contractors, here's where we physically expect you to build these. So they are general numbers, but they're ground in reality from the state of New York saying where they want contractors to build these. There's a vote against MJ Failway in New York. Um, we'll hold a couple more minutes, but then certainly can end early. There's a lot to dig in here. And as we keep saying, OCM is continually updating their website. Uh, there's updated FAQs, adding new questions. They also have a, a whole toolkit uh, with a presentation and a live presentation and video recorded, as well as PowerPoint that runs through various scenarios and eligibility. It shows you some application tips. It gives you some information about what happens after application. So we'll be covering a lot more of that in the next webinar. But if you can't wait, as we keep saying, don't wait, uh, you can check that out on OCM's website and dig in. Um, yeah. <laughs> Objection to NJ Freeway. Um, yeah, I think I, I would be surprised if New York ends up getting that. I think they've had Biotrack up till now. So do they stick with Biotrack or go to metric? That is the question. I don't think anyone knows. Yeah, I don't think they've awarded that RFP yet. Is there a way to get in contact with a real estate company for this license type? Um, ah, hi, Kim. So you can't. There's no point in getting into a real getting in touch with real estate companies for this license type because the real estate is being identified by the state and they are providing it to you. So this is separate from a regular um, retail license. Those license types are going to be available. Well, the regulations for those will come out later this year. Probably there'll be applications for normal retail early next year. But this type of license is only available to folks with past cannabis convictions and who um, uh, are willing to basically take what property the state is giving them. Great. Hang on for another minute. Um, but if we've done such an amazing job of answering all your questions, which is I'm, what I'm going to chalk this up to, <laughs> Maybe that's it. Ah, how do they determine how much capital a cardholder gets? That's a great question. Like, are you going to get more if you have more financial need? Like, I, I think it'll depend a bit about on where in the state you're located. I also how much uh, funding they have in the fund at any given point, since presumably they want to share it amongst uh, card licensees. Yeah. I don't know. I think that the fund has had a slow start in raising money. So it's a real question of how much they actually manage to 
to raise here. Raising money in cannabis is not exactly easy these days. Um, do you need to show seed money? I would say no, you don't at all. There's no place in the application for it. Steve, that sound right to you? Yep. You can show it to the, I mean, to the extent you have it, like it is something that you might be able to reveal through your governing, your uh, corporate governance documents or otherwise, but there's no requirement that you have it. In fact, that is a one of the principles I think, say of this application. Yep, I think they're asking about source of funding more to get uh, to your TPIs rather than you making sure you have enough liquid funds to run a dispensary. They more just want to know, hey, if this is uh, your source of funding, but you never disclose them to the state, that could be a problem. It's a question about using my own locally approved location. No, you can't, not for the card license. This is going to be possible if you're a social equity candidate for a normal retail license, probably early next year, unless the rules change. And there was a request to go back to the RO question, um, when medical, oh, the possible retail start date for existing medical providers. That is a different question from what we've talked about. There is still no date for when the existing medical providers, the ROs can transition to adult use. Have you heard anything in terms of that, Michelle? So what they're waiting on first and foremost is find out what the fee is. That fee is gonna be paid into a social equity fund. Uh, and that has been the holdup rumor as of this week is they've all been notified as to what that amount is, but now we'll see who can pay it and what that application transition process goes. So I hate to say another, we're not sure yet, but I, I think probably early next year now that they at least uh, supposedly know the number that they're required to pay in order to convert. For request, is there a format of the retail application you can look at now? Look at the card application mock-up, the second bullet point here through the um, OCM's website. If I'm awarded a card license, how soon can I apply it for a second license? So we don't know if there's gonna be future card licensing rounds. All we know is this initial round and it's only open for 30 days. So, and you can have up to three licenses, three retail licenses. So if you are trying to apply for more than one, you've got that 30 day window now, or if you're interested in applying for one of the future retail, we don't yet know when those other applications will become available. Right. Uh, if someone has a past cannabis conviction, I'll take this last one in New York State, but doesn't presently live there. Do they qualify? Uh, I believe there is no present requirement to live in state, but certainly the conviction, conviction did need to occur, but you will disclose where you lived, a time of conviction, as well as where you live today. And that could be a factor in your, your ranking, your scoring criteria. All right. And how important is retail experience? Um, I don't know that it's required at all. They do ask about whether you have past retail experience. So to the extent you have it, um, definitely list it. And it is a possible point in your favor. Yep. So and it's in the scoring criteria. So if it ends up being competitive and there's a bunch and they're coming down to the wire, that could make the difference. Um, but certainly if you don't have the experience, we don't mean to discourage anyone from applying. Right. Well, that is the end of our webinar. Um, as we said, the links, well, the link to the PowerPoint will be shared with all of the attendees after the event. So hope you all have a great Thursday and thanks for joining us. See everyone next Thursday, part two. Very exciting. Stay tuned. Thank you. Bye everyone.